ask you to come with me on a journey again, just or even at least think that you're going in this uh, time machine. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen. Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Brothers, sisters, respected guests, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's a bit dark in here. I can only see a few brothers on the front row. Uh, MashaAllah, may Allah give utmost a reward uh, to the Shaykh, MashaAllah, for his very inspiring uh, speech and his very inspiring fundraiser. But following on from that, we need to ensure that the pledges that we have made, we honor them. It's very important. Often what happens is that, you know, we make the pledge, but later on we get home and you realize that money that you pledged was for the sofa set which you promised your wife and the Nia changes so inshallah we need to make sure that we honor that pledge the sheikh uh, mentioned something which is uh, he mentioned about three things that we need to recognize and I want to speak about three things we should preoccupy the minds of every single human being one, where did you come from? Second, what are you doing here? And third, where are you destined for? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the Khaliq and the Malik knew that these questions should preoccupy man's mind. So he mentions all of them in the Quran. Regarding where you came from, Allah mentions in many places. But one verse Allah mentions, Hal ata ala al insani hinu min ad dahk lam yakun shaykhan madhkura. Was there not a time upon man that there was no dhikr of him, that there was no mention of him, he did not exist? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man, min nutfatin amshajin, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man from a mingled piece of sperm. Regarding what we're doing on this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ That I have not created man and jinn, but for one reason, and that is servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, where is man destined to? Allah mentions that in the Quran in many places. ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ and to me you shall return and I will tell you about the actions that you did in this dunya but if we look around us in this society you will see many people dissipate their existence without ever thinking about their purpose in life why because they are engaged in the now the now the dunya they are more interested in the high heels and the low heels, the baggies and the tights, the iPhones and the iPads, the X5s and the houses in Salihal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the now in the Quran. He said, dunya illa mata'ul ghurur. He said, the life of the dunya is nothing besides goods of deception. He says that now is a life of deception. And I'll give you an example of this. You know, you guys have all had dreams. You have dreams. One night you're sleeping and you have this dream that you have a beautiful house in Sully Hull. You look out the window and you see your Ferrari. You look behind you and you have this beautiful wife or beautiful husband with impeccable character and then you wake up in the morning and you walk towards your window and you open the curtains and you look outside and you realize you're still living on Coventry Road 
you look down and you see your micra. And then in the background, you hear your wife saying, Oh, Zalma! Oh, you Zalim! Then you realize, That that dream was a deception. It was a delusion. Have you ever heard about Gazamfor and Parveen? You know, there's this thing about, you know, Asian women and micras. You know, Gazamfor had a wife, her name was Parveen, and Parveen passed away. You ever heard the story? Yeah? You're going to hear it again anyway. <laughs> and Parveen passed away, so he wanted to write obituary, so he went to his local newspaper and he said, you know, I want to write obituary, but I've only got 10 pounds. They said, for 10 pound, you're going to get three words. So he thought, okay. So he said, okay, write down, Parveen is dead. Now the guy felt sorry for him. You know, he said, maybe he wants to write, my beloved Parveen is dead or something. So he said, okay, I'll give you three extra words free. He said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, okay, write down, Parveen is dead, micro for sale. So you have the now. And really people are in this deception. They dissipate, they go through their entire life without realizing that they have a purpose. And this is why Ali radiallahu anhu said, he said, people are sleeping. Only when they die will their eyes really open. Man believes he's awake, but only when he dies, he will realize that he lived a life of delusion. And it was for this that the Anbiya والسلام, came to this dunya. They came to wake up people. They came to call people. When Allah mentioned to the Prophet وسلم, he says, Qul. He said, O Messenger of Allah, say, Qul, hadhi sabili ad'u ilallah. He said, This is my path. I call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala basiratin upon manifest truth. Ana wa manitabani. Me and those who follow me, we call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn al Qayyim al Jawzi rahimahullah mentioned something very profound here. He says, anybody who calls towards Allah is on the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And anybody who calls towards anything else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not on the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he goes further. He says, anybody who calls towards other things, he's more interested in calling towards his group or to the people that he hangs around with or football or cricket. He is not from the followers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you look at the real followers of the Prophet Sallallahu the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, every Sahabi knew the virtue of Salah in Mecca. Every Sahabi knew the virtue of dying in Medina that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that his intercession is wajib for him. But how many Sahaba died in Mecca or Medina? They died in Istanbul. They died in the mountains of the Caucasus. They died in the depths of Africa. They died in the India subcontinent. Why? Because they re realized that they had a purpose in life. And that was Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Ukhrijat Linnas Ta'maruna Bil Ma'roof Wa Tanhuna Anil Munkar That you are the best of people. But it's a conditional clause. You are the best of people. Why? Why? So you can aspire for a big house? So you can have a big car? So you can have a big bank balance? No. Ukhrijat linnas. You have been taken out for the benefit of humanity. You leave, as the Sheikh was mentioning, you leave a legacy behind you. That's why Allah created man. You leave a legacy behind you. You look at Uqba ibn Nafi. Uqba ibn Nafi radiallahu anhu was known as the Mufti of Egypt and the conqueror of Africa. And the narrations mention that when he reached the Atlantic, 
He could see no more land in front of him. He took his horse into the water, into the sea. And when the water came to the neck of the sea, for the neck of his horse, Uqba radiallahu anhu said, he said, I swear by Allah, if I knew that land was on the other side of this sea, I would cross this sea and I would convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these people understood their purpose in life. And if you look into the life of the Prophet وسلم, the most difficult time in the life of the Prophet وسلم, was what? Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Messenger of Allah. She said, Oh Messenger of Allah, what was the most difficult time in your life? And the Prophet وسلم, said, she said, was it the battle of Uhud when 70 Sahaba were martyred? And the Prophet وسلم, said, no, it was when I went to give dawah to the people of Taif and the leaders turned against me. The leaders turned against me and then they set the urchins and the low lives of Taif upon me and they began to pelt the Prophet ﷺ to the degree the narration mentioned that the entire body of the Prophet ﷺ was flowing with blood until his sandals began to stick to his feet because of the blood and when Allah saw this Allah sent the angel Jibra'il والسلام, and the angel Jibra'il والسلام, said to the messenger of Allah he said oh messenger of Allah if you wish I will command the angel who controls the mountains and he will crush the people he will crush the people of Taif and the Prophet وسلم, what did he say you know, Ibn Ashur mentions under the verse, Alam nasharah laka sadarak. Did we not expand your heart? Did we not expand your chest? You know, like we say in the English language, we say, bro, you got a big heart. He said, if that was the meaning of that verse, that for the sake of dawah, people would pelt the Prophet ﷺ with stones. They would insult him, but he would take it because he wanted them to call them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was occasion when a Bedouin came to the messenger of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Bedouin said to the messenger of Allah, give me something. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him and then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, have we been good to you? And he said, you haven't. And the Sahaba saw this, that this man came to ask the messenger of Allah, he gave in and then he turns around and says, you haven't been good to me. And the Sahaba jumped up and they wanted to deal with him. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, calm down. And then he went home and he called the Bedouin. And he said, you came to me and I gave you. And then you insult me. And he said, oh Messenger of Allah, you were really good to me. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, you know, now my companions have something in their heart for you. Go and apologize in front of them. And he went in front of the companions and he apologized. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, said, my example and the examples of this Bedouin is like a person who has a camel and the camel runs away and the people run after it. And the more they run after it, the further it runs away until the owner says, I know my camel better than they do. I am more gentle upon my camel. And then he goes towards the camel and he tells the others to go away. And then he calls the camel and the camel comes to him and he ties the camel and he takes the camel. He said, this is my example and the Bedouin's example. If I had listened to what you had wanted after he said what he said, then he would have entered the fire of Jahannam. So the angels said, if you wish, O Messenger of Allah, I will tell the angel who controls the mountains to crush the people of Daif. And the Prophet ﷺ declined the offer. And then what did the Messenger of Allah say? And this is subhanAllah, and this is exactly what this conference is for. He said, maybe somebody from their progeny will embrace Islam. And then he said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dha'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas ya arhamar rahimeen. He said, oh Allah, I complained to you about what? Who is this? This was the Messenger of Allah, the greatest of dies. He said, oh Messenger of Allah, oh Allah, I complained to you about my own weakness. 
and the lack of my ingenuity and my insignificance in the eyes of people. Do we ever think about dawah in this manner? We think we're going to put a couple of tables and the people should all flock towards Islam. Where's the, where, where's the reflection? Where's the thinking of how to give the dawah? Where, where's you know, the humility and the most difficult time in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu was in giving dawah. Let me tell you about what the most difficult time upon this ummah was. If you gather all the suffering of the Muslim world today, it does not compare with a fraction of what the Muslim ummah went under the Mongols. When Genghis Khan, history records, that there were only two generals who never lost a battle. One was Genghis Khan and the other was Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, the sword of Allah. When Genghis Khan and his descendants, they ransacked, they decimated the Muslim world. And this is no exaggeration. Western historians mention they reached Poland, they reached Bulgaria, they reached Moscow. But they mention that what they did to the Muslim world was unparalleled in cruel, cruelty. When they, took, they, when, when they took Bukhara, the narrations mentioned, they gathered every single Muslim in the masjids and they butchered them. When they took Samarkand, they gathered the Muslims outside Samarkand and then every single Muslim was butchered and then they cut off their heads and they made pyramids out of their heads. They made pyramids out of their heads. When they took, when they took Gurga, Gurgans, I think that's the place. Juwaini, the famous historian, mentions that there were 50,000, 50,000 Mongol soldiers. Each one had been given 24 Muslims to execute. And then after that, they marched upon where? They marched upon the Muslim Caliphate, Baghdad. Baghdad was the most beautiful city in the Muslim world, if not the most beautiful city in the world. Mustasim was the Caliph. And when Halugu reached the outskirts of Baghdad, Mustasim consulted his, his advisors and they said the best thing is that you go and ask for terms and Halugu has made it clear he said if you are going to come out don't come out by yourself bring your most your great your advisors with you bring your ulama with you so Mustasim came out with 700 men and Halugu only allowed 18 to enter into the tent and they took the rest. This was the cream of the crop of Baghdad and they butchered every single one. And now Mustasim is standing in the court of the Mongol prince. And the same Mustasim, people would come to his court. He would rebuke, he would chastise, he's shaking in front of Halugu. And then Halugu mentions that I'm going to keep you alive for a while. And the reason that they kept him alive is that they wanted him to go back into Baghdad and tell his men to put their weapons down. So they took him back to Baghdad. And when he had told the people of Baghdad to put their weapons down, the narrations mentioned they brought his three children in front of him and then they butchered them. Then they brought his sisters in front of his own, in front of him and in front of his eyes, they killed his sisters. And then they gathered the ulama and they began to kill all the Sunni ulama. And then Halugu said that the blood of the Muslims is halal for the next 40 days. They unrelentingly butchered the Muslims for 40 days. In those days, you didn't have, you, you didn't have machine guns. They would make the Muslims line up 
and they would pluck him like you pluck a chicken from a poultry farm and then they would slaughter him for 40 days this went on the muslims were so petrified the narrations mentioned that a woman would enter into a mongol woman would enter into a muslim home and she would kill every single individual and nobody would fight her back a mongol woman would tell a group of muslim men don't move from here and they wouldn't move from there and she would go home and she would bring a sword and she would butcher every single one narration mentioned that one mongol would kill 40 children after killing their mothers the entire population of Baghdad was close to the entire population of Birmingham and half of the population was destroyed and after 40 days Halugu came into Baghdad and he gave an order that this killing should be stopped and many of the Muslims had dug graves dug graves and they were hiding in these graves many ate dogs cats even corpses to survive this was the situation and then halugu said to mustasim he said bring me your wealth so he bought him his wealth he said no bring me the wealth which is hidden and in the middle of the palace there had a hove and underneath was the treasure which had been gathered for the last 500 years for the last 500 years the abbaside caliphate caliph caliphs had hid their wealth there in one day it went up and then they imprisoned Mustasim and they starved him and Mustasim asked for some food and Halugu sent him a platter with gold upon it and he said what am I gonna do with this gold he sent it back and then Halugu went to him and look at this this is a non-muslim he's telling the Muslim king he said if you can't eat it then why did you hoard it for if you couldn't eat it, why did you hoard it for? Why did you give it to your men? So they were ready to die for you. And then he took him and he showed him the big gates of Baghdad. He said, what good are these big metal gates when there is no men to defend them? Why didn't you break these gates and make lances out of them and give them to your men? And Mustasim said, it's Qadrullah. And Halugu said, I will show you Qadrullah. And they rolled him up in a carpet. And then they had him trampled by the horses. 800,000 Muslims died. 800,000. The Darul Hikmah, the greatest Muslim library in the world. Millions of books were ransacked, thrown into the Euphrates. Until the Euphrates went black with the ink black with the ink and the halugu found it so difficult to stay in Baghdad because the stench of the dead corpses that he moved out of Baghdad this is what happened with the Muslims but then let's ask ourselves a question how was it possible that in a period of 80 years the same barbaric Mongols became Muslims they became ambassadors because there were men and women who carried on the dawa even in this state nothing perturbed them people died for this dawa the sahaba died to promote and propagate this deen when the women in the time of the mongols were at the forefront of dawa princess risala she was taken a prisoner by genghis khan's son juicy and after he died, she gave dawah to his son, Baraka, and he embraced Islam. And the same Baraka then fought Halugu. Urghana was the wife of Qura, the great grandson of Genghis Khan, the grandson of Choktai. Choktai had a great dislike for the Muslims. And Qura could not bear to hear the name of Muslims and then Urghana embraced Islam and she gave dawah to her son Mubarak Shah and he embraced Islam there were men who sacrificed their lives Tukluk 
Taimur Khan. He was a prince from, and one day he was going out. He went out hunting. And a group of Muslims went in this path where he was hunting. And he said, how these people coming into my path? And amongst those men was a man from Bukhara called Jalaluddin. And he said, bring these people to me. And they brought them to them. They bound their hands and they bound their feet. And then Tukluk said to Sheikh Jalaluddin, he said, how dare you come in my path? And Sheikh Jalaluddin said, we're only travelers, we didn't know. And then Tukluk said to Sheikh Jalaluddin, he said, this is how they regarded the Muslims. He pointed to his dog. He said, tell me, are you better or is my dog better? He wanted to humiliate the Muslim. But the humbleness of the Muslim changed the landscape of history. He said, are you better or is my dog better? And Sheikh Jalaluddin looked at the dog and he said, if Allah forgives me, then I am better than your dog. But if Allah doesn't forgive me, then your dog is better than me. And his word permeated the heart of Tukluk. And he said, untie him. He sat with him. He gave him dawah with zeal, with sincerity, until Tukluk said, you know, I agree with everything you say, but I can't embrace this religion now because I am gonna be, I am gonna take the throne soon. When I take the throne, come back to me. And Sheikh Jalaluddin passed away, but before he passed his way, he said, when Takluk becomes the king, make sure that you go and give him dawah. His son's name was Rashiduddin. And when he became the king, Rashiduddin went to Takluk, but he couldn't get an audience with him. So what he did one day, he stood by his window and he began to give the adhan. And Takluk was enraged. How could anybody wake him up in the middle of night? And he said, bring this man to me. And when they brought him to him and he reminded him about his promise to his dad. And Takluk said, I swear by Allah, since that day I've taken the throne, I have been waiting for Sheikh Jalaluddin. But nobody came to me. And then Takluk embraced Islam. And on that day from the windows of the palace, you heard the adhan being given. And the entire... His entire kingdom embraced Islam. Why? Because these people had a concern. They had a concern. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said in a narration related by Ibn Majah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inculcates in this ummah secret soldiers. Secret soldiers. And they propagate this deen until the day of judgment. And this is what we need. We need people who have a concern. We have a, if out of this conference, we have a person who has a fraction of the concern of the Prophet Sallallahu emanate, who has a concern like Risala or Ghana, Sheikh Jalaluddin, Ahmad al-Sarhindi. Look at Sheikh Ahmad al-Sarhindi. Subhanallah. Look at his dawah, which he gave to Akbar. Akbar had changed religion, changed Islam totally. What we don't need is a Pauline kind of Christian Islam. You know, where you accept, for the sake of Dawah, you accept everything. Whatever they say. You know, Paul. Paul was a guy who, who because he gave Dawah to the Gentiles, he believed that he couldn't bring the Judaic laws into it. So he just made, he gave him dawah towards Allah, but that was it, nothing else. And we, this is something that we don't need. We need people who give dawah, who understand their deen, and who are firm on their values. Akbar was a man, subhanallah. Akbar was a Mughal king who was in India, and what happened is that he started his own religion, which was called Deen Ilahi. And in this deen, and you will see throughout history, those who have done the greatest damage to Muslims have been those enemies within. He made pork halal, he made wine halal, he made gambling halal. But it was haram in his kingdom to slaughter a cow. Parda was haram. The beard was haram. You had to do sajda to him when you went into his court. 
You had to do sajda to him. He abrogated salah. He abrogated hajj. He abrogated zakah. And his salam was not a salam alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. It was you would have to say la ilaha illallah. And the other person would say Allah Akbar. Because he had Akbar's name in it. This was his deen. And he persecuted the Muslims. And then Allah created one man after his death. When his son Jahangir, he was on the throne. A man called Sheikh Ahmad al-Sarhindi rahimahullah. And he was giving dawah and Jahangir heard about dawah and he called him to his palace. And when he entered into his palace, he said, do sajda. He said, I only do sajda for Allah. And Jahangir became enraged. And he said, do sajda or otherwise I will imprison you. He said, you see this forehead. It only touches the floor for the sake of Allah. And he imprisoned him. And whilst he imprisoned him, like Yusuf والسلام, was imprisoned for the haqq and he gave dawah towards Allah. The narration mentions thousands of people embraced Islam on the hands of Sheikh Ahmad. Thousands of people. Until Jahangir became impressed and then he called him to his court again. And again he refused to do sajda to him. But Jahangir saw that this man was different. He wasn't like the other scholars. He stood to his principles. He believed. He was firm in his belief. And he said, stay around with me. And for the next three and a half years, Sheikh Ahmad al-Sirhindi remained with Jahangir. And he changed the religious landscape of India. Men who were ready to do the dawah. And I say to you, you know, there are many people really out there who are good people. They need that. They, they're waiting for the dawah. And may Allah reward the brothers of Ayer and no exaggeration. You know, they've bought something novel and they need the support. Bringing people toward from eternal doom to eternal success. What could be greater than this? Many of them are good people out there. And this reminds me, you know, of the narration of Abu Talha when he proposed to Umm Salma. And Umm Salma said, she said, Wallahi, mithluka ya Abu Talha la turad. She said, Abu Talha, the likes of you should not be refused. You know, when you propose, you shouldn't be refused. But there's one thing, I'm a Muslim and you're a kafir. If you embrace Islam, then your dowry for me is your Islam. Is your Islam. And he embraced Islam. And his dowry for Umm Salma was his Islam. But she saw the good character in Abu Talha. And Wallahi, what a Mubarak wedding. I swear, I don't have time. What a Mubarak wedding. It was regarding these two that Allah revealed the verses. يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا he was the man who acted upon the verse and many many other amazing incidents in this life so i come back and i finish off here back i come back and i finish off here you know the importance of the dawah and if we look into the life of the greatest man to walk on the face of this earth after the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Can you imagine Abu Bakr on the day of judgment coming in front of Allah? He, he took this deen. He believed in it and this is why he was called Sadiq. And then he propagated it. Out of the ten who were guaranteed Jannah, Six of them embraced Islam on the hands of Abu Bakr. Can you imagine Uthman bin Affan, the man regarding the, who the Prophet ﷺ said, he has so much shame that even the angels have shame from him. Abu Baydat ibn al-Jarrah the man regarding who the Prophet ﷺ said, if there every ummah has an ameen and the ameen of this ummah is Abu Baydat ibn al-Jarrah Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the man regarding who the Prophet ﷺ on the battle of Uhud, a thousand times the Prophet ﷺ said, may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. May my mother and my father be sacrificed. Can you imagine, and a, nug, and a handful of others, can you imagine on the day of judgment, when these people will come, 
and their actions will be in the scale of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Can you imagine this? Upon occasion, the Prophet ﷺ said, the first person for whom the scale will be erected for on the day of judgment will be Umar ibn Khattab. And the Sahaba were astonished because they knew the virtues of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And they said, what about Abu Bakr, or Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, for the likes of Abu Bakr, there are no scales. For the likes of Abu Bakr, there are no scales. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who called to his path May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in dunya. May, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannatul Firdaus. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.